So I'm going to start today's lecture by uh, kind of finishing what I talked about yesterday, giving uh, some ideas on, on the proof. And when I'm done with that, I'll move on to a totally different topic. Um, I'll, I'll talk about kind of number theoretic questions related to automorphic forms. But let me first uh, remind you what we were uh, doing. We had a variety inside An defined by a polynomial f of degree d. Um, and uh, we fix a1 an is over over field k uh, in k, where the kind of associated projective point uh, is in the vanishing locus of the leading term of f. Uh, and then we define more d comma p of uh, a1x to be tuples, the set, or the, the variety, or scheme parameterizing tuples g1 through gn of polynomials, or sorry, more ep. Of degree s equal to e. Solving, solving f, so f of g1 through gn is equal to 0. Um, and uh, the leading coefficients ai. You mean coefficients in degree e? e. Yes. It could be not the leading, but okay. degree e. Um, so the so polynomials, tuples of polynomials solving this equation are the same thing as morphisms from a1 to x, and by bounding their degree, I, I've, I've given myself a finite type moduli space, and by, by fixing the leading coefficients, I, it turns out I make that moduli space very slightly easier to study. Um, and so our goal is to compute the compactly supported cohomology of this moduli space over an algebraically close field with coefficients in the l numbers for i large. Um, and I, and I, I said last time how large i we would be able to do it for. Um, and so the idea of the proof is rather than using the cohomology to count points, we're going to first figure out, or first, when we say estimate, the number of rational points the number of FQ points and then apply the same techniques. Um, so, okay, let me, let me go over here first. I want to write a long line. So how do we how can we count this, uh, this number of points? Well, um, I, want, I want to take the counting problem we have and kind of split it into an easy part and a hard part. So we were counting tuples g1 through gn in fq joint t. <coughs> I'm not going to tuples uh, 
of degree g i less than or equal to e i f of g one through g n is equal to zero, and then the leading coefficient say i. Oh yeah, sorry. Let's think of the should. Ah. So I want to express that in a way that's kind of silly, as a sum over tuples satisfying most of those conditions. Leading coefficients are ai. The sum of the function that is 1 if f of g1 through gn is equal to 0 and 0 otherwise. Um, so roughly speaking, what, what I've done, so this set we're summing over is a set that I understand pretty well. It's very easy to count the number of elements of the set. I have e free variables for each polynomial n, and each of them has q values. This is a set of size q to the en. And there's lots of like simple functions which I know how to sum over this set. For example, functions that only depend on the congruence class of the polynomial modulo some polynomial of small degree. Um, and so a general strategy, I want to express this function that I want to sum in terms of some functions that may be simpler uh, and, and, and some of those simpler functions. Um, and there, there is a very general tool that we use repeatedly in, in, in analytic number theory when we have this kind of function that's one if an equation is satisfied and zero otherwise, which is um, to detect by characters. Use the fact that the average of the characters of a group at any element is one if the element is trivial and zero otherwise. Um, so, so um, let, 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 let me write this. It's a sum over the same set, g1 through gn and fq of she. Degree gi less equal to e, leading coefficient ai of 1 over, so the, the, what does f of g1 through gn lie in? It lies in the group of polynomials of degree less than d times e. Because the gi have degree at most e, f has degree d, so you get d times e, but the leading coefficient vanishes. Um, and that, that has q to the de members. So we get q to the de times the sum. I'm going to parameterize the dual group using, using linear maps. Um, so alpha. Um, alpha, where so P D is the space of polynomial, or sorry, P D space of polynomials of degree less than D times E. So this is just a vector space over F Q, and I'm considering linear maps from that vector space to, to the base field, and psi is a character of the additive group of FQ, a non-trivial homomorphisms. So I'm taking a linear form on this vector space, or you know, an element of the dual space, I'm, I, I'm, I'm evaluating the linear form, which I'm writing as, as a dot product. So I get an element of the base field FQ. And then I apply this character psi, and I, and I get a, a complex number. And when I sum that complex number over all the alpha, if f of g1 through gn is 0, this, this dot product will be 0, and so this will be 1. And so I'm just, just summing 1, I'll get q to the de. Uh, and if, if, but if f of g1 through gn is not 0, the sum will cancel. Um, so it's, a, it's the kind of same basic algebraic fact. We use like to check 
like inversion of the Fourier transform and, and all kinds of things. There's like orthogonality of characters. Um, and, and, and using it, I have rewritten my, my sum. Um, and I want to I want to do that again whenever I have two sums in number theory I always want to try to reverse the order of the sum and, and see if that helps So you get 1 over q to the d out front Sum over alpha these linear maps pd Well, all right alpha in the dual of, of pde The sum over g1 through gn and fq to g degree gi less or equal to e, leading coefficient ai, psi of f, g1 through gn, dot alpha. And I'll call this maybe s e of alpha. It depends on some other stuff, but it'll suppress the dependence on other things. So, what we've done is transformed the counting problem into, into a sum of these functions, S e of alpha. Um, and it, it, it's very much not obvious that we have, we've improved the situation at all. By doing this, it's not obvious that it's easier to understand these functions, S e of alpha, than our, um, than our original sum, um, but it, 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 it turns out to be the case. And, and, and a big part of the reason that this is, is we can now, we can now analyze S e of alpha by different techniques. For different alpha. So sum of the alpha, it's not so hard to calculate the value of this sum. In particular, for alpha is 0, this dot product is just 0, so this is 1, and the sum is just q to the d. So alpha, um, or q to, q to the any. So alpha to the 0 is very easy, alpha equals 0 is very easy to, to study. And it kind of, alpha equals 0, the alpha equals 0 term all, already gives us the most naive expectation. We have e de equation in any variables, so we might expect there's q to the n e minus d e solutions, and that's what we get just from the alpha equals zero contribution of the sum. Um, and in general, alpha which only depends, um, alpha such that alpha dot f depends on only on f mod h for h of small degree. So what's one way of constructing linear forms in a space of polynomials? You just take some fixed polynomial h, you mod out your polynomial by h, and you get a, uh, an element of the quotient space, you just take any linear form on the quotient space. Um, so that's a way of constructing very special linear forms that, that are different from a general linear form. And those will, be, those will be easy to evaluate the sum because this polynomial module h only depends on the gi mod h. So you get a sum now over residue classes mod h, and if h factors into primes, the sum factors uh, over the primes, and you end up with sums over finite fields, and you can apply you know, Deline's theorem to these sums over finite fields, that, that, that you, can, you can evaluate them kind of explicitly, um, and, and you, 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 can, you can bound them and, and you can relate them to counting points, solutions of f over these finite fields. So, for, for like, for such f, for such alpha, we evaluate S e of alpha explicitly. Uh, and these give the main term in our sum. These give, these will give, in fact, the, the constant that um, we expect in, in Manin's conjecture, the constant 
uh, we get as a product over primes involving counting solutions mod that prime will come from these alpha that are of this very special form. And then for all other alpha, we bound SC of alpha. So if alpha is special, we can calculate this sum, but the sum is often very large. And particularly in the worst case of alpha is zero, the sum is as big as it could possibly be. It's, it's q to the ne. If, if alpha is not special, if it's general, if it's not of this form, then the sum is not easy to calculate, but at least it's probably small. So we just try to show an upper bound on the absolute value. And then by combining the exact calculations for uh, some alpha with bounds for the remaining alpha, we get our, our counting estimate, which has a main term and the error term. Um, so why is this called the circle method? So this is the circle method. This is the basic strategy of introducing these characters, switching the order of summation, then splitting up the set we're summing over, applying different techniques for different sets. Why is this called the circle method? Well, this was developed over the integers, where you'd be, you'd be counting problems like x1 through xn in Z, absolute value of xi is at most some bound B, f of x1 through xn is equal to 0. Um, and so you'd end up with uh, some sum where now the, the, the key term, the complicated function you're trying to sum, is, is 1 if f of x1 through xn is 0 and zero otherwise. But now the sum is uh, um, the sum the, the equation is over the integers. We're trying to check something as zero over the integers. And you're trying to check something as zero by characters, you need to use characters of the dual group. The dual group of the integers is the circle. So this ends up being the sum of some kind of integral over alpha um, in the circle, maybe in R mod Z of uh, e to the 2 pi i f of g1 through gn times alpha. So we have a character evaluated in an integer, like a pairing, a perfect pairing between integers and the circle. Um, and so, and so then we're going to break up, we're going to switch the order of summation and break up the circle in, into various intervals. Um, that's the classical circle method. And then here we have a pairing between a vector space over a finite field and the dual vector space. And we switch the order of summation and, and we break up a vector space over a finite field into dual. So, so if you're working with a ring of integers of a more general number of fields, did they do something like the circle method that should the circle be replaced by the Pontragian dual of the and of integers or? Exactly, so it would be a torus. Yeah. Um, and so, so notice I'm doing it here using a subset of the polynomial ring. You could, do, you could do what I'm doing here using the full polynomial ring, where the dual would be some kind of pro-finite group, um, and it would just be equivalent to what I'm doing. Um, so, what does this mean? Um, so, in, in particular, to understand what this means geometrically, you, we need a geometric interpretation of this, this function SC of alpha. Because the whole circle method is about studying this function. Uh, and so we would like to interpret it geometrically. We'd like to interpret it as, as, as a sheaf. 
And so there's kind of two parts of it that we have to interpret. There's the sum and then there's the character. And so the sum we interpret by a, a highly general method. So um, the, 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 the twisted form of the left shift's fixed point formula, I guess, says that if you have a map of varieties and you have a sheaf on x, uh, then the sum over i of the trace of prob q, the sum over, over y and y of fq, sum over i minus 1 to the i, the trace of Rubanius on the stock of ri pi shriek f at the point y will equal this. Oh, I'm not, sorry, I don't want to sum over y. Equal the sum over x in pi inverse of y, uh, the trace of Frobenius on the stock of f at x. So I have some function that's expressed as a sheaf, as a trace of Frobenius on the stock of a sheaf. Summing that function over the fibers of a map can be uh, expressed using the, the derived push forward, the derived compactly supported push forward of the sheaf. So I, I, get, I get another or sheaf, a really complex of sheaves, which <coughs> tells me the sum. And so here we're summing over you know, just an affine space, which is very easy to express as, as the fiber of, of a map. Um, and we have a projection, you know, just a projection map. So the main thing to, to geometrically interpret SC of alpha is to construct a sheaf whose trace of Frobenius is, is given by this, this, this psi function. Um, and so this is done by, by, by Arden Schreier's theory. So this function is like a polynomial function on, on some big affine space with coordinates given by the coefficients of all these polynomials. Um, and so you can, you can plug that, um, you, can, you can use that polynomial to build a covering of affine space. So y to the q minus y is equal to f of g1 through gn dot alpha defines a finite et al covering of um, a d e times a n e. So the a d e are the coordinates of alpha. The a n e are the are the coordinate are the coefficients of g one through g n. Uh, and then y is this one new coordinate I'm using to find the covering. Um, and this finite tile covering has Galois group fq. Because if you add any element of fq to y, you get another solution of this equation. Because y to the q minus y is preserved. Um, so that gives us a homomorphism from the etal finite group of a D E times A N E to F Q, which we can send to the L attic numbers using psi. Um, and so this gives us a one dimensional representation of the Italo fundamental group, uh, which defines a sheaf, which we'll call L psi of F of G1 through Gn dot alpha. You have to take the extension of the Eladic numbers. Where oh, yes. Very good point. And it's actually very important for the argument that I, that I do that. I don't want to choose an L so that the, L through, the P through the unity are all contained in QL. Um, and then <laughs> if you unravel the definitions, the trace of Frobenius on the stock of, at, at this point
at some point will equal the value of the function at, 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 at that point. Um, which is just because what does Frobenius do? It sends y to y to the q, and that's the same thing as adding f of g1 to gn dot alpha just by, by this equation. Um, and, and so you, 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 you then take this sheaf and you, you, you push forward along the projection. Um, dot alpha for pi, the projection from ADE times ANE to just ADE. And this gives you a complex of sheaves on this affine space. Um, and what you can guess from this identity up here is the cohomology of this complex of sheaves recovers the covalent groups we want up to some shifting and tape twisting. And then once you have that statement in mind, you can prove it using the theory of the Al-Adic Fourier transform, which is a geometrization of the classical theory of Fourier transforms, uh, which uses exactly these and trier sheaves. Um, So, so basically, it suffices to calculate the cohomology of A, D, E, K bar with coefficients in this R pi streak, L C of F dot alpha. So, Because a lot of you might not find these R and trier sheaves so intuitive, I'll, I'll point out that there's, there's a different way of doing it using, um, so in, 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 instead of taking the cohomology of the affine space twisted by this alpha, you can consider um, just the cohomology of the set where this dot product is zero. So just the hypersurface where this dot product is zero. Um, and if you think about it, x is defined by this linear system of, 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 of equations, the f of g1 through g on dot alpha. And so there's like a, a family, a high dimensional linear system of these hypersurfaces. Um, and if you take the cohomology of the base parameterizing hypersurfaces with coefficients in the cohomology of the hypersurface that gives you the cohomology of the total space, phi array spectral sequence, when you can relate the cohomology of the total space back to the cohomology of x. Um, it's like some blow up of some affine space at, at x kind of thing. Um, uh, and, 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 and so in, in, in both cases, you're led to this problem of calculating this cohomology all of the space parameterizing linear forms. And the only reason that's easier is because we can break that space into different subsets and um, uh, and uh, apply different techniques at, 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 at different um, at different points, at, at different, at different, on different parts, um, and so, so in particular, um, there's a stratification. A D E emits a stratification into closed subsets. Um, where a m d e, so one way to express it is the closure of the set of linear forms a 
obtained by evaluation. at m points. So evaluating any point gives you a linear form. Evaluating m points, you can take any linear combination of those linear forms. The set of all linear forms on polynomials you get that way is locally closed, and I'm considering the closure. You know, so maybe my points can collide or go off to infinity. Um, uh, and it has a, a ni nice description in terms of the rank uh, of, of, some, of some matrix be, be, being small. Um, and so, like, for m equals 0, this is only going to pick up the, the 0 form. And then for m equals 1, it'll pick up like a two dimensional space of, of linear forms evaluating at points. And m equals 2, it'll be four dimensional, it'll be larger and larger closed subsets. Um, and uh, for m less than or equal to e, we can calculate like the stock of r pi shriek l c of f of g1 through g on a d e m explicitly. Um, so, so, so using the fact that alpha, the alpha is a linear form that only depends, say, on the value at m points, then you can express this sheaf as like a tensor product of sheaves coming from each of those points, and the you know you can use the Kuhnhoff formula to say like the cohomology of tensor product is the tensor product of the cohomology. Um, and then you get a bunch of kind of simpler cohomology problems, and then you, you get a, a very explicit answer for what the cohomology can look like. Um, and not only can we calculate the stocks, we can give a nice description of the sheaf on the on the strata, the strata like A D E M minus A D E M minus one. Um, so the so these strata, uh, and these are the source of this kind of spectral sequence. So anytime you have a space with a stratification, you get a spectral sequence computing the cohomology of the space from the cohomology of the strata, and we calculate the cohomology of each of these strata by kind of formal manipulations of, of this sheaf. Uh, and that gives the, the spectral sequence. Um, and then, uh, uh, at points not in a E D E, we prove a vanishing result. Um, of the cohomology in high degrees. Um, and, and the vanishing result uses a technique called vial differencing which takes these exponential sums and multiplies them by, to their, by their complex conjugates and, and re re reduces the exponential sum problem back to a counting problem. Uh, and so what we did is wrote down a geometric version of the vial differencing argument um, that reduces the cohomology vanishing problem to a problem of bounding the dimension of some variety, and then we use Langve to reduce that to a counting problem, and then for the rest of it we kind of follow the, the, the numerical ar ar argument exactly. How high do the degrees have to be? Um, the degrees of, of what? The oh yeah, so the, so the trivial bound, I mean, so this is a 
So this is a variety of dimension NE we're taking cohomology of. So the trivial bound is that it, or not, I shouldn't say trivial, growth in the cohomological dimension is that it vanishes for I greater than 2 N E. Um, and so what we're going to do is 2 N E minus uh, something which is going to be linear, linear in M. So linear in how far in this stratification we are um, times, uh, I'm not going to get the constant right, but it's like n over 2 to the d minus 1 plus. It's, it's, some, it's, it's, some, it's some explicit thing like this. Um, so as, as we get, as M grows, the strata get higher and higher dimensional, and, and the cohomology we can, is, is appearing in smaller and smaller degrees, because our cohomological dimension result is, is getting better and better. Did you not call that the technique? Oh, vial differencing. Um, and so it's, it's, it's this geometric form of vial differencing that um, leads to this funny condition on the L that I, that I, that I mentioned yesterday, that L should be, have even order modulo the characteristic. Um, because vial differencing involves taking the complex conjugate of the exponential sum and the fact that the complex conjugate has the same size. And then doing that for character sheaves is tricky without independence of L results unless L is such that the, the complex conjugate of this character can be obtained by an automorphism of QL bar. So if psi is such that the, the inverse character, the complex conjugate character, is, is a conjugate also by an element of the Gal group of QL, then um, we, we, can, we can run this vowel differencing argument. So I mean, sufficient independence of L results would remove that, 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 that assumption, of course. So of course, it is known for the kind of alternating sum of things that you have independence of L, but not. Uh, you need it for individual shifts, which is kind of difficult. Uh, yeah, exactly. So, so, yeah, but for pure perverse, ah, there is no way to use the perverse. Um, if you just restrict to pure perverse shifts, you can still. Do, do, I, mean, I, I don't think so because like, I have no reason to believe that these push forwards are, are perverse. Okay, okay. Um. So another geometric question here, you consider M distinct points, but instead you can consider Hilbert schemes of a uh, degree. Uh, because I'm thinking the closure, it doesn't matter. What? Because I'm thinking the closure, it doesn't matter. But I, I just, just, can you recall to me, not, like, whether the Hilbert scheme of zero sec is the closure of the of the part where you have distinct points? It is, yeah. I'm on a curve, so it is the closure. Ah, it is on the curve. Ah, so then yeah. it's quite simple. Ah, okay. Yes. And, and and so the reason I expressed it as a closure is the closure also involve also allows me like the points to go off to infinity. Um, and it, there's not a very simple way to express what happens as the points go off to infinity, but just saying the closure is pretty simple, and that's good enough. Um, um, I mean, let me, let, me, yeah, let, me, let me mention the explicit criterion also, because uh, it, it, it's, it's very simple. If you, just, if you just take the matrix, you can evaluate alpha at the polynomial 1, the polynomial t, all the way up to the polynomial alpha t to the m, and then at t up to t to the m plus 1, and then here it goes up to alpha of t to the de minus 1, and so here it goes, I guess, up to alpha to the t to the de minus m. If the rank of this matrix is less than m, that is if and only if alpha lies in a D. 
Uh, so this sequence alpha of 1 up to alpha t to the m, what we want it to do is basically satisfy a recurrence relation of length at most m. And, and, and that's, 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 that's the definition. Um, so does anyone have further questions about this? Yeah, maybe just a small one. So you, you, um, you stated something over a general field, but then in the proof it was, uh, you know. Oh, yes. So, okay. so the, the point is that you can use spreading out to go to the finite field case. And, 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 and use this, this art and trier stuff. So if you're in characteristic zero, you can kind of always, you know, you can always choose a characteristic where the whole argument works and you reduce to a, a nice finite field. And then if you have cohomology vanishing in all the finite field specializations of a point, or in most of the finite field specializations, that gives you um, cohomology, or, or cohomology vanishing or cohomology isomorphism results uh, at, at the generic point, kind of. Would this be the Whitney stratification for the push forward also? Or would these be like local systems on the open locus of the... So for... No. So even, so even for, for, for M greater than E, there's no hope of calculating the Whitney stratification. We just can't describe this sheaf precisely enough to know exactly what it is, like exactly where it's least. We only know it's vanishing in, cer in certain degrees. For m less than or equal to e, um, I, I can describe a stratification where it's least. It's a little bit more refined than this. So when, when, when two points collide, uh, here it doesn't matter. But when two points collide, you'll, you'll see a singularity of this sheet. Actually, so the, actually, so when m is less than e, part of, part of the proof is that it's the closure of this set, but it actually vanishes um, away from this set. So it vanishes at the sheet vanishes at points at linear forms, which are not which are lying the closure of of, of form of, of forms obtained by evaluation at points, but are not themselves evaluation at points. So a stratification which it was its least would be like forms evaluating at m points and then the closure and then forms evaluating at m minus 1 points and then the closure and the forms. It would look like that. So it would be twice the number of strata. However, <laughs> in characteristic P, the notion of Whitney stratification is not really well defined. So I can only say a stratification onto its least. Uh, I, I can't say the Whitney condition, or at least it's not a meaningful condition. Is, is, that, is that a way to guess? That like if you I mean if one didn't think of A D E M in the way you stated, would, would it be intuitively correct to think of stratifying the space into sort of Zariski open where this is this and then look at the complement and then look at Zariski open? Or, 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 yeah, well, is, is that certainly if you did that, if you looked at the high degree cohomology groups first, you would certainly get this same stratification. So the, because I know the high degree cohomology groups are vanishing outside of these, these specific strata. So yeah, if, if, if I handed you the sheaf and I told you what the stocks were at different points, you would, you would be able to recover the, the stratification from the sheaf, at least the low, the, 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 the low values of m part of the stratification. So it is, it is, it is a natural stratification to consider uh, when um, when, when, when studying the sheaf. Um, but I mean, yeah. Um, Yeah, actually, well, let, me, let me say one, one thing about what this means in, 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 in very geometric terms. So these, if, if you think about this kind of version with hypersurfaces, you consider uh, for each alpha the, the, the hypersurface uh, where this equation is 0. Um, then what you'll see 
what the stratification will mean for the hypersurfaces is that for small values of m, those strata are hypersurfaces with enormously large singular locuses. They have huge singularities. And the hypersurfaces for large values of m, we can show the singular locus, lo locus will have smaller dimension. Um, and, 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 and so the, the fact that the dimension is smaller lets you control the cohomology by general results of the hypersurface. So, so another way of saying what we're doing is you have your variety, you want to calculate, you compare the cohomology to all these hypersurfaces. Some of them are very are reasonably smooth, and you can kind of bound their contribution to the cohomology using general bounds for hypersurfaces in terms of their singularities. And the other are um, singular, and you have to really explicitly calculate the cohomology. And you do by like separating variables, by, 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 by ultimately using, using the Kuhn form. Um, so I now want to talk about something different, uh, which is automorphic forms, or, or, or mo more specifically, modular forms. Um, and so what I've decided to do to kind of avoid getting drowned in, in notation when I talk about this is, is to say, say most things uh, just in the, like the case of classical modular forms, or the, or the case of GL2, kind of, and then, and then gesture uh, at, at what happens in general. So um, I want to consider really classical modular forms, which are functions from, from, from the upper half plane in the complex numbers, or the complex numbers, which are holomorphic, is a modular form. of weight k and level n. If f of z is equal to c c plus d to the minus k of a z plus b c z plus d for a, b, c, d, and gamma 0 of n, uh, which is equal to SL2z subject to the condition that c is equal to 0 mod n. Um, and uh, also, there's some kind of growth condition, which is annoying, az plus b. D is bounded as mz goes to infinity for a, b, c, d, not just in the subgroup, but in, in, the, in the whole group. So let's see. Um, and There are a lot of interesting number theoretic questions about, about modular forms and their generalization automorphic forms. It's probably an understatement. Um, and, and, and kind of the most um, or I guess I should say I should say what, what Heike operators are, right? So I don't know if I need to say this, but I'm going to say it. So like the Heike operator T, P to the K acted on F evaluated at the point Z uh, is the sum 0 to K over 2 sum over A, B, C, D and gamma 0 double coset okay, no, you can't write it I'll write it over there. Uh, 
Uh, so the, um, I mean, the, most, the most important one is, is, is that there should be uh, some relationship between modular forms uh, and, and, and Galois representations. Um, I guess so. Um, I guess the, the way I've written that we have some vector space of modular forms should have some isomorphism to a vector space of functions on certain Galois representations. Um, an isomorphism satisfying some expected properties. Uh, and uh, and uh, so a lot of cases of this conjecture are uh, known over integers, um, but over function fields, kind of even more progress has been made. Um, and in particular, for the analog of, of classical modular forms. So, so in, in, in function fields, field fq of c, c an algebraic curve over fq, there should be uh, an isomorphism between a space of like modular forms on like GL2 FQC and then a space of functions on two dimensional Galois representations from the Galois group FQC to GL2. And so in, in, in this case, this was proven by Drinfeld. Um, and, and, and Drinfeld did this using geometry. He did it, in fact, using two different kinds of geometry. So he found two different ways to interpret um, automorphic forms in the function field context geometrically. Um, So one of them, that's too high. So Drenfeld developed kind of two geometric interpretations. Oh, I mean, I guess three, right? Because one using just vector bundles, one using Drenfeld modules, and one using Stukas. Um, and I'm not going to talk about the Drenfeld modules and Stukas ones today. I just want to mention them because these are the ones that are very similar to the geometry that appears when we try to study automorphic forms over the rational numbers. For example, the modular curve has geometry that's similar to a modular space of Drinfeld modules. Uh, and so these behave in the way that people are the most familiar with if they are, if they've seen the theory over the rationals. Um, and the, and, the, and the moduli spaces of vector bundles behave in a way that's really different. Um, and so even though it, you know, they're really simpler objects, like it's not very hard to define an Drinfeld module, and it's, and it's easier to get your hand, or sorry, not very hard to define a vector bundle, and it's easier to get your head around what they're doing than a Drinfeld model or a Shuka, um, there's a stranger from the perspective of, of the classical theory. In particular, because their moduli spaces have these enormous dimensions. But that's the kind of the same phenomenon that we see in all these analytic problems is the spaces of interest are very high dimensional. Uh, 
Um, and so, um, I'm I, I, I'm bringing up this this conjecture on the the equivalence of some vector space of automorphic forms with some functional Galois representations because you know building on Drenfeld's work people started to study this conjecture in the geometric setting and it took on an incredible life of its own in the in the geometric Langlands program that people have found a geometric analog in the same way that this calculation of the cohomology of the mapping space is a geometric analog of counting points of some kind of equivalence of categories between a category of sheaves on a moduli space of vector bundles and a category of sheaves on, on a moduli space of Galois representations. Or representations of the final group, at least. So what is high depth, very big dimensional here? It's nothing dimensional. Um, okay, so the moduli space of vector bundles has very high dimension as the genus of the curve grows. For ah, okay. Whereas ah, the, the so these moduli spaces, they don't grow as the genus of the curve grows or as the level grows, but the, uh, the, the moduli of bundles does. Um, so what I want to talk about is, is what about other questions, in particular what about analytic questions about modular forms? What is the, can there be geometric approaches to uh, analytic questions about modular forms in addition to al algebraic ones? Um, and I mean, the answer is yes. There's a, I think there's a lot of interesting uh, uh, ways to connect the kind of analytic theory of, of, of automorphic forms to, to geometry. Um, So the, 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 I'm going to talk about two, um, two, two problems in the analytic theory of, of, of modular forms. The, the, the first one uh, that I expect most of you will have heard of is, is, is the Ramanujan conjecture. Um, and the second one, which I expect a lot fewer of you will have heard of, is, is, is the supernorm problem. And, and so, so I'll spend a little bit of time, ho hopefully not too much, talking about each one and, and what it kind of, what a geometric approach to it would be and what kind of geometry um, y y you, you see. Um, and, uh, um, uh, and, but not, not try not to go into too much detail. The proof. So first the Ramanujan conjecture. What, what is that? So we have these, um, these HECA operators acting on modular forms um, defined by the P to the nth HECA operator applied to F evaluated at Z um, is like I think if I normalize that by p to the n times, uh, okay, minus one over two um, times the sum over matrices a, b, c, d inside the double coset gamma zero sum from m is equal to zero, k over two. Sum over matrices A, B, C, D. Close again, 0 of n. P to the k minus m, 0, 0, p to the m. Gamma 0 of n. Modulo gamma 0 of n. Of the same term, C, Z plus D to the, or if it can't be k. Z plus D to the minus k f of a is e plus v. Okay. 
So it comes from the fact that this twisted action of SL2Z on the upper half plane comes from really a twisted action of SL2R on the upper half plane. Um, and, and, and so in particular, these elements that lie in SL2R but not in SL2Z act on it. And, and, and from these elements, we kind of produce an operator. And it's by choosing it to be like, summing over a set that's like left and right invariant by gamma 0n, we, we, we make it send forms of level n uh, to forms of level uh, n. So p is uh, not divisible of n here? Yeah, so p for p, p, p not dividing n. p not dividing n. Uh, and so the conjecture is that the eigenvalues of t, p to the n on, on cusp forms, which are forms where instead of being bounded as mz goes to infinity, this goes to 0 as mz goes to infinity. Um, I think if I've normalized it right, these are bounded by n plus 1. Um, and so, the Ramanuj conjecture is known for, for classical modular forms. And the way it's known is via the Langlands correspondence. We take a modular form that's an eigenfunction of these Hecke operators. And from it, we construct a Galois representation where the eigenvalues of the Hecke operators are related to the trace of Frobenius on the Galois representation. And then we um, uh, and then we apply Deligne's theorem to bound the eigenvalues of Frobenius on the Galois representation, and we therefore bound the Hecke operators. Um, uh, and so uh, this is a this is a powerful technique, but it's not. We, do, we, we haven't currently ma made it work in, in all cases. Um, and um, so um, what I want to talk about is a technique developed by myself and, and Templier for proving cases of the, Hecke of the, the Ramanujan conjecture, which doesn't rely on like Langland's reciprocity at all. And, and, and only involves a, a, a little, little bit of, of, of functoriality. And, and it's based on a kind of a different, um, uh, different perspective. And this, what you speak about, will apply to any reductive group? Yes, it will apply to any reductive group. Um, may I ask a quick naive question? Is there, there's, um, there's no Archimedean component, but is there an analog of Selberg's conjecture? Um, I mean, I think it would just be the Ramanujan conjecture again, because because there's no Archimedean component. And in the case of the Selberg, you're referring to the Selberg one quarter conjecture? I, I mean, I assume. <laughs> you should ask, ask her. Is it, the, in that case, is there also something in the Archimedean component of the representation? That, there is no Archimedean. That is, the non-Archimedean components, because it's always a tensor product of local. Yes, so. There, which is also something like the Ramanujan conjecture, analogous to this. Yeah, so, the, so they can be formulated in terms of the automorphic representation as saying that the local representations are all tempered, which, which means that the matrix coefficients of the representations viewed as functions on the local group are almost in L2. Um, so if you have the detail of what al almost means there. So there is, it's, it, it, it has been, in the modern understanding, it's interpreted as a purely representation theoretic conjecture. Um, but... Um, For to clarify, I meant the classical statement is about um, eigenvalues of the Laplacian. Yes, but just, I mean, just to answer this question, yes. So uh, it has a representation theory information. Uh, yeah, and so that's actually kind of a good point because the, 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 my method with Tom Plier, it, it doesn't work, uh, at least not currently, for the Ramanujan conjecture at, ra at ramified primes, for showing temperedness at ramified primes. It's specifically a method about eigenvalues of Hecke operators. 
And so it only will work at an array of five points. Um, so the, 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 the point I want to, the observation I want to make about um, the, the, did you say that? about these eigenvalues um, that I, I'll make it first in a classical setting and the same thing will work in, in function fields is because there's algebraic relations between these eigenvalues, this statement is equivalent to a, uh, a number of statements that are seemingly weaker. So it's actually equivalent to say the eigenvalue of tp to the n Uh, is bounded by c times n plus 1 for any constant c. Um, um, and, and it's because you could relate powers of tp to tp to the n. So by bounding the eigenvalues of tp to the n, you bound the eigenvalues of powers of tp and not bound to the eigenvalues of tp. And you amplify, you get a better bound by doing that. So you can get rid of this constancy. Um, so I want to actually take advantage of that. Um, uh, so I want to observe that the Ramanujan conjecture holds for all forms of weight k and level n. If and only if the trace of tp to the n squared on the forms of weight k and level n, I guess all cusp forms, uh, is bounded by c times m plus 1 squared for any c. So why is this true? Well, the, the only if direction is just because this is, has real eigenvalues, so the square is positive, and so if I can bound the trace, I bound any of the individual eigenvalues. Uh, and the direction the other way is because each term under the Ramanujan conjecture is bounded by m plus 1 squared. And the number of terms is some, some constant. Um, so uh, um, so, so you, you automatically get a bound of this, this form just, just from the trivial bound. The trace is mostly I of has some trace. So we can actually interpret the Ramanujan conjecture for this whole family of forms at once as a statement about the trace of uh, this, this heck operator. Uh, and that is a statement that is more um, admissible of a, of a geometric interpretation uh, because uh, like, you, know, you don't have to worry about an individual automorphic form. You can you can just geometrically interpret uh, the, the space of their functions. What, what about the dimension of uh, the space of of cast form? I missed this part. So if you know that for each for each form, you know that you have the bound, then you still need the dimension to the number of ah the dimension is fixed. Mm -hmm. is fixed. Yes. So the constant is depending on k and n. Okay. Okay. Because it's, if you get better representation, you get immediately exponential growth. Yeah, no. y yeah right. yes. Replaced by a cube or whatever, yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah, so it, in, in, um, yes, in, 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 yeah, so there's a gap between the polynomial growth and the exponential growth. And in fact, the way our method works, it doesn't exploit that gap. Um, but it's possible that uh, there is a way to do it. Um, so what we want to do is to um, interpret modular forms geometrically uh, and, 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 then, and, then, and then understand the trace geometrically. Um, 
and um, uh, um, well, so let, let, let me say it like this. I'm I'm interpreting so uh, there's two ways to there's, there's many ways to define modular forms in in the setting of, of, of function fields. So there is the kind of there's the, the, the there's the kind of adelic way, which is you take your field f of functions on a curve. You look at GL2 of the Adels of that field, you mod out by GL2F, and you mod out by some compact subgroup. And you look at, for example, L2 functions on, on, on this. Um, but um, for, for anyone who, if that definition is not intuitive, let me, let me give a kind, of, uh, a kind of concrete model, which is we're going to replace the upper half plane uh, by uh, GL2 of formal power formal Laurent series in the variable T inverse divided by formal power series in, in the variable T inverse and also by scalars. Um, so this is also can be described as the vertices of the Bruhat Tetz tree. Uh, so we, we replace, if you take a hyperbolic plane, let the limit as the curvature goes to infinity, you get a, you got an infinite tree. And we, we're replacing um, the upper half plane by uh, an, an infinite tree, or at least the vertices. And the modular forms will just be, there will be functions uh, invariant under uh, gamma zero of n, which will just be the set of triple, of matrices A, B, C, D in SL2 FQT with C congruent to zero mod n. Uh, and so you just have them invariant under this function, so you could also view them as functions on the, um, the, uh, quotient, um, and the quotient of this t tree by the group will, will be a graph. This graph will have some kind of complicated looking finite part, and then it'll have like a more simple part, like in, an infinite part going off to infinity. Um, and um, for, for, for eigenforms, the definition of a cusp form is very simple. It's just a form where uh, this, the, the function becomes zero eventually on this infinite part. It has, it has finite support. So there's, there's a definition of modular forms in this setting that are, is, 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 is kind of um, similar to the definition of the classical setting, uh, but it also admits this very nice geometric interpretation uh, because th this quotient set can always be interpreted as the set of, of vector bundles of rank two on a curve over FQ uh, with extra structure. Uh, so in, in this very concrete case, Gamma zero of n modulo G L two F Q double C inverse modulo G L two of T um double square brackets of T times T to the Z. Uh, this would be equal to the set of uh, I guess we'll this will be PGL two bundles 
on P1 over FQ with a rank, or let's say rank two vector bundles. With a rank one sub bundle uh, over the, the, the vanishing locus of N, the vanishing locus of, 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 of the polynomial N uh, modulo line bundles. Modulo t twisting with line bundles. So we're looking at vector bundles on this curve, in this case P1, with some extra structure. At, 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 my, at, at this divisor, this closed subscheme, the vanishing of n, we're, we're fixing a subbundle of rank 1 on this subscheme. And then we're, we're, we're modding out by something. We're, we're, if you twist by a line bundle, we'll count that. It's the same. Uh, and so this is the same thing as the FQ points of some moduli space. So in this case, it would be bun 2n, the fq points. So automorphic forms are going to be functions on the fq points of this moduli space. Um, and uh, so the Hacke operator Um, is, a, is, a, is an operator taking functions on this space to functions on this space, has a kernel, which is a function on the square of the space. on 2n squared of fq. Um, so, so the, um, the Hacke operator, you know, you're taking a function on, on, on bundles and you're writing it as a new function by, by summing over bundles which are related to the original bundle by taking a, a uh, a sub bundle or a, a, a sub sheep whose quotient is, is supported at, at, at one point. And um, you, you can express that as the action of, of a, basically a matrix of, 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 a, of you know, the action on a space of functions of, of, of a matrix which is given by some function on, on the square of the space. And we're just trying to bound the trace um, to bound the trace. Um, and so this has a this function has a geometric interpretation. There's like a moduli space of pairs of vector bundles with a map between them where the co-kernel is supported at one point, and that maps to the square of the moduli space of bundles. And we're just taking the push forward of the constant sheep. Yes, let me, let me write that down. So the um, the Hecke kernel is like a pi shriek QL for pi. It's the map from moduli space of pairs of bundles, v1, v2, and a map from v1 to v2, where the co-kernel of f has length uh, n and is supported at, at, a, point, at a point p, Support, supported at p. Uh, and this maps to the pair v1, comma v2 maps to the set of just pairs v1, v2. So is, is the trace. Um, so we have, um, so, um, we, 
we can express the um, Hecke operator is coming from this kernel. This kernel is coming from the trace of Rabinius on the sheaf, which comes from some variety mapping to the product bun 2n cross bun 2n, or some stack mapping to the product bun 2n cross bun 2n. Um, and this is all very, very explicit geometry. Um, and so we need to show uh, the trace is, is not too large, so we need to, to prove some kind of cohomology vanishing result for this sheaf. Yeah. Uh, well, I can just write the trace of square in terms of the original traces. Um, and so this is a strategy, but there's one really big problem with it, which is we can only hope to prove the bound that we want if Ramanujan holds for all forms in our space of form. We look at the trace in the space of form, we can only get this bound if it holds for every single form. So the problem is that I have set up this space of forms to include both cusp forms and Eisenstein theories. And Eisenstein theories are known not to satisfy Ramanujan. So to, to make, to get even a hope of proving the conjecture, I have to get rid of the Eisenstein series. And I have to do it in a geometrically nice way. I have, I, have to, I have to make a kernel which only sees the Eisenstein series and doesn't see the cusp forms. Um, and so I, I have to, um, but I don't know how to just subtract the Eisenstein series directly, so I do something more, more drastic. Um, Uh, I put a local condition that forces all forms to be cuspid. Um, so rather than choosing functions that are invariant under a subgroup like this, you can choose functions that are equivariant for a non-trivial um, character. So the kind of thing you can do is you look at matrices A, B, C, D, where A and D are congruent to 1 mod T, C is congruent to 0 mod T, um, and then you have some identity like a, b, c, d, dot, f should not equal f, but should equal f times psi of b plus c. b plus c over t. Or let's say b mod t. Um, so this is not quite gamma 1, but th this is... Um, I'm choosing this subgroup to be, this subgroup is a little bit smaller than gamma 1 because I'm setting both A and D to be 1 mod T. This is a Iwahori subgroup, and I'm choosing a generic character of the Iwahori subgroup in that case. And so this is going to force my forms to have a local representation, which is what's called a simple supercuspital representation. Uh, and it's a theorem that if your re local representation is supercuspital, the form is cuspital. Um, and so, and so, Um, this condition on the form is a condition I can detect by the kernel. Um, I, 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 just, I, I, I just have a Hecke kernel, I put this psi into the definition of the Hecke kernel, and then I'll produce a Hecke kernel that only sees forms which, which satisfy this, this, this twisted invariance property. And um, on the geometric side, that corresponds to changing this definition so there's some local condition on the map at a specific point, 
and then putting an art and dryer sheaf in, 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 into, the, into the geometry. And so I'm pushing forward not the constant sheaf, but, but an art and dryer sheaf. And in the general case, you'd be pushing forward like an intersection cohomology sheaf coming from the geometric sake isomorphism. You'd be pushing forward that tensor with an art and dryer sheaf. Um, so it, it, it's kind of, it's very easy to put this kind of condition into the geometry if you're by twisting something by an R and trier sheaf. And then you have a hope of the theorem being true because you've thrown away all the things which are not expected to satisfy Ramanujan. You have only things which you believe are expected to satisfy Ramanujan. Um, but you still need to prove something about, about the Hecke kernel. Um, and so the kind of the key theorem is that the Hecke kernel, or this, when it's twisted by psi, comes from a perverse sheaf. Um, and it turns out if, 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 you, if you calculate the bound you get from perversity, um, you, you get a bound for the trace in terms of a power of Q times some Betty number. Is it the pure perversity? Uh, yeah, the, the proof yeah, the proof shows it's pure. because it, it's yeah, so what, what happens, you have some pi shriek of some LPC, and you have a pi star of some LPC, and there's a natural map between them. And the proof shows it's an isomorphism. So that gives you the yeah, it's, it's a pure perverse sheaf. You have a per perverse sheaf on uh, a product on, on some kind of bun bun two squared, a product of two moduli spaces of vector bundles with extra structure or, or G bundles with extra structure. Um, and, and so this, this gives you a bound for the trace. Yes, we're still using the vague conjecture, but not applying it to the Langlands parameters, so some, some totally unrelated, or seemingly unrelated sheaf. Or, you know, or rather, maybe I should say an in, a very indirectly related sheaf. Um, uh, this gives a bound uh, of the form Um, trace of tp to the n squared on our space of modular forms um, is, is so the is is bounded by dim s times some constant depending on n. So the if you look at the, the the power of q that appears from the weights, it's like perverted exactly the weight you expect. So the bound you get is like exactly the trivial bound you'd get under the Ramanujan conjecture. So you get expected the dimension of the space of forms times the bound for an individual form. And, and the power of Q that shows up in our bound is exactly the power of Q that shows up in the space of forms. However, we have no idea what the Betty numbers of the sheaf that show up in our bound are. They could have some totally arbitrary dependence on N, for all we know, they could be much, much worse than exponentially in F. So we get an estimate that has like good uniformity in Q, in the finite field Q, but absolutely none of the uniformity we want in, in this lowercase n, in, 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 in the degree of the Hecke operator. Um, and so there's, there's, there's a trick, which is to Uh, use cyclic base change. So there's some theory that given a modular form on FQ of C will produce modular forms on a field extension, any cyclic field extension, and we're going to apply it to a specific cyclic field extension FQ to the E of C, extension of the base finite field. Uh, and the uh, Hacke eigenvalues on the two sides can be related. 
Um, so we apply our bound to a much larger finite field that will give you a bound for the trace up here, uh, and we, we can deduce, which will give you a bound for the eigenvalues up here, we can deduce a bound for the eigenvalues down here. Uh, and so using that, you can amplify, you can turn a bound that looks weaker into a bound that looks stronger, and that will give you a bound of the form that you want. That will replace your bound with, with dim s times m plus 1 squared, um, using the algebra of how these Hacke eigenvalues are related. Um, So, um, and do, do you get all the cards from? You said that you, you, you choose a particular condition that is sufficient to ensure that you have a cards from because you control the representation with a specific super cards yes. one and something else. So, this is not everything. Correct. So, we, this representation that I wrote down, like this condition is, is, is a special case. There's other similar conditions that work for us that I didn't write down, but it is absolutely not everything. So we define in the paper a specific class of local representations that our method works for, um, and we can prove it for every representation that at one of these places satisfies that condition. Uh, but there's tons of cusp forms that don't satisfy that condition. In particular, there's tons of cusp forms that are unratified at every single place. And, um, and, 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 and so our, um, our, our, represent, our, um, our argument fails for those. And that, that, that's, that's one caveat to, our, to our, 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 our theorem. And the other caveat that appears in the statement of the theorem is, is the cyclic base change is not a theorem for arbitrary groups over function fields. So we, we need to use it. I mean, we're working in the case of, of general split reductive groups beyond GLN, because the Ramanujan conjecture is known for GLN. It's, it's a theorem of Laforgue. Uh, but um, so we need cyclic base change for these general groups, but that's not proven. Uh, the people who are experts believe that it can be proven by the known methods, uh, but I think still nobody, ha nobody has done it. So the, the, it's a theorem, it's, 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 it's a Ramanujan conjecture at unramified places, subject to this two caveats. We have this local condition, and we need to, we need to assume cyclic base change. Sorry, but if you have some um, quaternary group, there's no cusp form. Uh, this all forms are cusps. So uh, yes. And the depth of idea. Um, no, and so the problem is that, yeah, so I, I thought about this. The problem is that we need everything to be true geometrically. So quaternion groups, if you extend the base finite field, then it's no longer quaternion, so it no longer has this everything in cusp form property. Uh, and, and because we're trying to prove a geometric theorem, the geometric theorem can only be true if the Ramanujan conjecture is true, not just for all forms in our family, but all forms in the analogous family you get when you extend the base finite field. So, 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 so quaternion algebras don't work, and in, in fact, it's a theorem that there's no groups with that, that have that property, when, like the property that every like, form is cuspable, the property that they don't have any, any parabolic subgroups. There's no groups that have that property when you extend the finite field in this way. Um. You mean no non-trivial semi-simple group on mm -hmm. Which kind of groups you consider? Uh, yeah, okay. Th maybe a way of saying that is that every field, every group over, yeah, every reductive group over FQC, over the field of functions over a finite field, it becomes quasi split over an extension of the base finite field only. So it, 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 it can't be, it, it, yeah, it, it will always develop a, a Borel subgroup as you go to an extension of the base finite field specifically. Um, it may not be split, but it's at least quasi-split.
Uh, sorry, where do you run into problems exactly when you have ramification? It does, it's not. Um, what do you mean when you, you mean when I don't have ramification? No, when you when you do. Except you. Well, it depends on the kind of ramification. Um, of representation or. So 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 the the method basically the method involves treating forms in in families. So tr I don't treat one form at a time. I treat a family of form set by local conditions, and there are some restrictions on the local conditions that are needed for the method to work. And the only restriction, I only have bad restrictions at one place. I, there's one place where I need to have a sufficient amount of like wild ramification. Uh, and if I don't have that in the local condition, the method doesn't work. Um, and, 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 and so you can see, you can see that the method doesn't work kind of just thinking about the statement because the theorem I would be trying to prove is not true if I put a weaker local condition at that place. Uh, but I can also, I will say at least a few words about, um, Uh, uh, about the proof of, of this, this, this geometric theorem. Um, so, um, like what, what about this map pi are we using to get, to get the perversity? Um, so, so this Hecke correspondence this modulus of pairs of bundles with a map between them is studied a lot in the geometric theory. And, but people usually think about a slightly different map. People usually think about the map from this to the modulus space of one bundle or to the modulus space of the, like the other, like sending v1, v2, and f to just v1 or just v2. Uh, and that map is, 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 is a kind of projective morphism. The fibers aren't smooth, but they have bounded. Their singularities are independent of the fiber. It's a locally trivial vibration. It's a very nice map. But the map pi is a different map. It's, it's, it's we're mapping from the Hecke correspondence to bun to cross bun to, to the of pairs of bundles. Um, and, and it has a different character. So in particular, it's not so hard to see that pi is affine. So if I have two vector bundles, the space of maps between them is an affine space, and this is true relatively on the model of vector bundles, and, 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 and the space of maps that have this property is, is, a, lo is, a, is a closed closed subset of that affine space. Um, so y y pi is an affine morphism, and so pi streak of an R and Trier sheaf will therefore be pure perverse if it's isomorphic to pi star. <coughs> so we have the, the, the cohomology of the compact subboards and the co ordinary cohomology. The ordinary cohomology is semi-perverse because it's affine. The cohomology of the compact subboards is like co-semi-perverse. If, 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 um, if they're isomorphic, then it's perverse. And the same thing works for purity. And whenever we want to tell cohomology with compact supports is the same thing as ordinary cohomology, it's very helpful to look at an explicit compactification. We want to say that they, the, these differ by a contribution of the like, boundary of the compactification, the divisor at infinity of the compactification. We, we say that contribution is zero, will we'll, we'll, we'll be done. And so we need to kind of define a compactification of the Hecke correspondence. Um, and then we're going to do, do this in, 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 a, in a fairly naive way. Like as I said, maps between from v1 to v2 are sections, are, are, are vectors in some affine space. It's a vector space of maps. And there's an obvious way of embedding that affine space into projective space. And that gives you a projective compactification. Um, and there, there's some more sophisticated ways to define compactifications of, um, of this Hecke correspondent. There's like a, there's a drinfeld lefort vinberg compactification, I think it's called. But a kind of naive way is sufficient for us. 
as long, um, uh, and then basically we have to show some rj star l psi vanishes locally on the boundary of that compactification. Um, so, so the way the compactification works is we're letting a map between v1 and v2 kind of go to infinity in the vector space of maps. Um, and, and so, you know, the way that projective geometry always works, things that go to infinity are just things like ordinary things up to scaling. So we end up with, with, with maps up to scaling, but what can happen is the maps were supposed to have rank two. And when they go off to infinity, they start having rank, rank, lower rank. They have, they have rank one. Um, so you, you end up with kind of studying locally these like lower rank maps between, between bundles. Um, and you, you, you kind of need a, a, a local model to, um, to, to study the local behavior of this sheaf and to check that something, something vanishes. Um, and so there's, I think, different approaches to, to finding local modules of this compactification, models of the compactification of, of the um, Heike correspondence. Uh, and, and we did it in, in, in a way that I thought was kind of fun. We used the space to model itself. So this, if you think about a Hegge correspondence, in the classical setting, the Hegge correspondence is itself a modular curve. Right? A pair of elliptic curves with, with a map between them of degree p, that is itself a, modu you know, a, point, a point of a modular curve. And so there, are exi there exist Hegge correspondences from the Hegge correspondence to itself. Um, and the same thing is true in our setting. This compactification has Hecke correspondences, which is use Hecke correspondences from the compactification to itself. Um, and since the Hecke correspondence is, is basically a smooth morphism, at least like kind of generically, at, this lets you see that a bunch of pairs of points in this space that are related by the Hecke correspondence are like locally isomorphic in the smooth topology because you have a space mapping to both of them smoothly. Uh, and, and, and so the, this sheaf is like, you know, the, the sheaf we have to study is, is, can be calculated smooth locally, so it takes the same value at a bunch of different points. Um, and so using this, you can start at any point in the space and you can follow a chain of Hecke correspondences uh, around to a space where, cal where, where calculation is very easy. And what you do is you just follow the Hecke correspondences to a point that's very, very high up in the cusp. And when you go up high up in the cusp, your vector bundles become very unstable. Uh, and that means they have a lot of automorphisms. And then those automorphisms really help you. You can use the automorphisms to show vanishing of the stock by showing the stock is invariant under the automorphisms and showing it's not invariant under the automorphisms and deriving a contradiction from that, uh, unless it's zero. Um, so in, in, in summary, we use geometry, which is kind of analogous to things you see in, 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 the, in the classical theory of modular curves, like we have these Hecke correspondences between Hecke correspondences, we have these points high in the cusp, but um, it's also kind of weird, like points high in the cusp don't develop all these automorphisms in the classical setting, but, but they do in, in the geometric setting. So, um, uh, does anyone have questions 
about that. So there is no analog of this in the classical case of uh, classical model of Ops on the upper left plane. There is no, you don't give any, you, this method doesn't give you any new insight. Yeah, I don't, I don't think so. So it might, with like sufficient brilliance, suggest something you can do, but it'd have to be very different from what we did. I, I have no idea. So one, one comment is, is, is I, I thought about what this compactification is. So, so it's one step of our method, this compactification. What it is in the setting of the classical Mosler curve. And there is an analogous definition, but it's like the furthest thing from a compactification you could imagine. Because the map that we're trying to compactify, one, it's already compact. So the relevant map is like the map from x0 of p to x of 1 cross x of 1. This kind of map in the classical setting, which is a finite morphism. So it's already compact. Um, and when we try to compactify it by the same method, the thing we have to add, we're actually adding a higher dimensional variety. It becomes like a. Or not, I think it becomes like a three-dimensional manifold or something. I don't remember exactly. It's a higher dimensional space we're adding when we try to compactify it. So it's already compact, and we're adding something that's much, much bigger. So it's very different from the usual notion of a compactification. Um, and it it's probably doesn't really have any meaning. Yeah, so like, I mean, like certainly all the Italic cohomology stuff we're doing has no meaning in the classical setting. But even this, um, uh, this uh, compactification doesn't seem to have meaning in, in the classical setting. Uh, however, I mean, when I thought about this stuff, the um, bungee on the, on the Farg-Fontaine curve had not been studied at all or had been studied only a little bit. And so maybe there is some meaning to some of this in the setting of bungee on the Farg-Fontaine curve. I have no idea. May I ask another question, yeah. which is maybe a, a little bit naive? There was a result, that, a theorem that came out last year by Harris and Shibotaru, which shows that in this setting, I believe, um, reduct, split reductive groups over a function field that if Ramanujan holds for one place, it holds for all places. Do you get, by an implication of their theorem? Um, yeah, so that. So. One observation you can make in the functional setting, I mean, it's easier to make, is that if, it, if Ramanujan holds at one unramified place, it holds for every unramified place. Oh, it has to be unramified in their work too. Yeah, I, th I think. I didn't notice it, it, it might be. So, yeah, so I, 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 think, I think that is, yeah, so that, that, that follows from the Lang lens parameter thing and. Um, uh, and and Deleuze's theorem. It follows from Langlands parameters and, 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 and Deleuze's theorem in, in, a, in a very easy way. Even though you can't yet use Langlands and Deleuze to prove Ramanujan directly for all forms, you can, you can show that if it holds at one place, it holds at another place. Um, so they, have to be, they have to be unramified or not? Yeah, it has to be unramified because at the ramified places, we don't have a good understanding of how to relate the Automorphic to the Galois side. We have this Laforge and STA theorem, but it's not very explicit. Um, so, there, so I, I, it, it, it might be that, uh, that I mentioned that fact to Harris, and that's why it's in the paper. I'm not sure. It might be that, he, that he, you know. So some some simple like some simple observations like that, like that are are are, are I. I there, there's observations that I made while working on this that I thought were much less interesting than the main result we were doing, but turned out to be kind of helpful in other, other kind of settings in, 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 in the great product of Lang Lens that like, like for example, that appear in my, my recent paper with Harris, and it, it might be related to that. But yeah, so somehow, yeah, okay. Well, right, let, let, me, let, me, let me make a comment about that so that, so the Ramanujan conjecture for groups other than GLN, it's not just for cusp forms. It's not true if you only restrict to cusp forms. There's an additional restriction of genericity. And so in our, our statement, we have this additional re restriction from this local condition, but it's not obvious why the local conditions we write down imply genericity, or it's not obvious if they apply gener in, in genericity. 
So we put in our paper some explanation of why our theorem should follow from the Ramanujan conjecture and the general philosophy in Langlands, because it's not obvious from the way we stated it that our theorem, in fact, in fact follows from that. Um, and uh, the, 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 that chapter, which is kind of disconnected from the rest of the paper, some of the ideas in that have, have, have also been helpful other stuff. Um, so in, 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 the, in the last um, in, the, in the last few minutes, let me, let me, let me set up what I'm going to talk about next time. So um, a completely different analytic problem about uh, modular forms and, 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 and kind of one of the most naive analytic questions you could ask is like, okay, f is a function from the upper half plane of the complex numbers. Let's not think about it as an automorphic representation. Let's not think about it as anything more sophisticated than that. Let's just think about it as a function. How big is the size of f? Um, and in particular, we can kind of normalize it so that the average size is fixed and ask, does it kind of stay mostly close to its average size, or does it sometimes get very large and other times very small? So, so what I say is like, how big is like the infinity norm, the sup norm, the, the max, like given that the some normalization, the, the, the two norm is is one. Um, and um, so you so in, in in the classical thing because it's not quite invariant under 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 gamma not n, you have to be a little more careful. So the, so the right thing to do is size of f of z times the imaginary part of z raised to the power k over 2. So the max of this for z in the upper half plane. If you, the absolute value of f is not invariant under the modular group. So if you, if you just apply the right element of the group, it gets very enormous. But if you normalize it by multiplying by a correct power of imaginary, it is invariant under the modular group. So it defines a function of the modular curve. If f is a cusp form, this function goes to 0 at the cusps. Uh, so this is, 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 is kind of well-defined. Find for cusp forms f. And you can ask how big it is as like a function, say, of the level of the modular form. Does this gr how rapidly can this grow with the level as the average size of f is, is fixed? And so this is a question that people have studied. And you can study the analog in the function field context. Um, and uh, what I'm going to talk about next time is how the analog of this function field context is related to some, I think, very nice geometry involving this modular space of bundles and then the modular space of Higgs bundles that maps to it and like the nil potent cone in the modular space and kind of how they, how they relate to each other. Um, but I won't, I won't spend the whole time talking about that. Uh, if you, are, are not a fan of the automorphic form stuff. After that, I'll, I'll talk about my next topic, which is uh, Galois groups and the distribution, distribution of, of Galois groups and the distribution of class groups and its relation to the geometry of Hurwitz spaces and also to questions in 
probability theory on categories. Um, yeah, so I think I'll stop here. Does it make sense to uh, see if there's an obstruction to not knowing the cyclic phase change? Does it make sense to not just look at t square, but look at t fourth, t sixth, and try to see how cn changes with respect to that? I mean, so the problem is I have no idea what cn looks like. So, uh, and follow from the explicit sheet that you have. Yeah, it's, it's not explicit in such a way that I can calculate the betting. I mean, it's very, very far, far from that. In, in, in fact, I mean, it's something. It's something explicit, but it's, so the, the kind of the algebra, so powers of, of, of tp to the n can be just written in terms of the other tp to the n, and then the, 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 way, the way that the sheet theory works is it kind of does that for you automatically. So you don't, you don't gain anything by trying to be clever instead of saying, I'll, I'll work with higher powers instead of working with a specific TP to the N. It's, it's, it's the same, you'd be getting the same betting numbers either way. Um, yeah, I, 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 I just currently do not have uh, a, a great idea for how to evaluate them. I mean, in particular, I'm pretty sure that they grow at least exponentially in n. Like in general, there's cases when I really know how to exactly calculate the Betty numbers of something relevant in function field number theory. And usually the true growth rate is exactly exponential in the dimension of the variety. When you, when you have a very good understanding of the Betty numbers, it's an exponential function, exactly. And so probably that would happen at least exponential in this case as well, because the, the this is related to the dimension. So it would be at least exponential, and so exponential would not be good enough to get it without um, amplification. Um, uh, which is, it's not, it's not the only case where the Betty numbers are exponential. And if they were sub-exponential, you could, you could use that to get, get something in, in, in interesting. There's also a setting in, in Hurwitz spaces where the Betty numbers are provably exponential. But if, if they were sub-exponential, then uh, that would be cool. Um. You give one on the individual uh, modular form? Well, yeah, it's for, it's for an eigenform that you want to give a bound for. Okay. It's not, uh, okay. But uh, yeah, so the, 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 I mean, the theorem is in the, in the function field con context. But yeah, so the, you actually, if it's not an eigenform, you actually can't give a useful bound in terms of the L2, because what you can do, you could say, I'm just going to choose an eigenbasis, and I'll choose a linear combination where the, the coefficient of each one is the complex conjugate of its value at a given point. And if you do that, you will get a form that's highly concentrated in one point and very spread out among the others. So the, the, the game is showing that eigenforms are not l like that. Um, which there's, there's, there's multiple kind of arithmetic methods to do, and there's also a geometric method to do. Um. 